Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and in this uh, third of a series of videos, I'm talking about the effects of asteroid impacts on the Earth. So I'll get right back to where I left off in the previous video. And there's a website, um, Purdue University, purdue.edu, Impact Earth. If you Google that, you can get this site here, Impact Earth. And we're looking at famous craters. And if I pick uh, the, the crater, the asteroid that took out the dinosaurs, you can calculate the impact effects. And it, so it, uh, it basically populates all of these different um, windows here with the diameter, density, impact angle, impact velocity, and the target type. And you can put in the distance that you are. So put in 200 kilometers, for example. 200 kilometers and calculate the impact. So it does a, while it's doing the calculations, it simulates a, an asteroid coming in and impacting. And you can get the energy and the damage and the radiation and so on. So thermal radiation. Well, 11.5 seconds after the impact, unfortunately, your position's inside the fireball. Fireball is 257 times larger than the sun. Um, you get irradiated by huge amounts of flux. Your clothing ignites. Your body suffers third degree burns. Fl plywood ply plywood uh, get, catches fire, deciduous trees ignite, grass ignites all in your region, catastrophic damage. The seismic effects, the, you get a shock wave about 40 seconds after the impact, you know, which is equivalent to a 10.3 um, magnitude earthquake. That's greater than any earthquake in recorded history. Everything collapses, okay. Um, the air blast, arrives 10.1 minutes after the impact and basically it knocks over all the buildings and everything highway trust bridges you know glass windows shatter cars and trucks displaced grossly distorted 90 percent of trees blown down all those things happen so all these uh, nasty things happen there's a tsunami the impact generated tsunami wave arrives about 1.77 hours after impact the amplitude of tsunami is about is between 40 and 81.6 meters. So between 130 feet high and 260 feet high. So all any any or all of those things can can get you. So let's have a another uh, impact here. You know this is the meteor crater, for example. If you've been to the meteor crater, and let's say you're a couple hundred kilometers away from the meteor crater from where that uh, event happened, 200 kilometers away, calculate the impact. Okay, this is kind of fun to, uh, you know, look at all of these scenarios. Okay, so let's look at the seismic effects. Well, it's only a 4.9 um, earthquake where you are 200 kilometers away. Uh, the air blast, um, it sounds as loud as heavy traffic, so it looks like you're okay. You're going to survive this thing. Thermal radiation, little vaporization occurs, no fireballs created, therefore there's no thermal damage. Energy, um, you know, 1.28 uh, times 10, so 10 to the first power. So 12.8 megatons of TNT, so not quite... Um, you know, not quite a hundred uh, Hiroshima, Hiroshima's, you know, likely to happen. Um, the average interval is about 1,200 years. Okay. Uh, okay. So you can also, you know, you can do, uh, you know, you can calculate your own impact playing around with any of these variables playing. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of, a lot of fun to do that. Okay, uh, this is uh, from the same group. It's probably older, um, an older page where you can just enter things here and calculate the same sort of thing. And there is a PD, PDF document on how the calculations are done for this uh, web-based uh, program. So this is a paper that came out 
you know, in 2005, talking about the algorithms and the way things are calculated, you know, the angle that the thing is coming in, and it talks, it basically goes through the physics of the calculations of the energy deposited, the size of the crater that's created, the air burst, the breakups, and so on. Okay, and the effects, the pre impact surface, and then the crater created, the rims are created, and so on. Okay, all of the different physics behind the impact is, uh, is calculated. Okay, so what are we going to do about these things? Well, there's a site called the Planetary Defense Coordination Office, believe it or not. Okay, and basically it applies... Planetary defense is applied planetary science to address the near-Earth impact, near-Earth or orbit impact, near-Earth object impact hazard. So NASA established this Planetary Defense Coordination Office. That would be so cool to work there. You know, you're on the bus or something, and somebody says, well, what do you do? Oh, I'm, I'm with Planetary Defense. Um, people would look at you kind of strangely. So it provides early detection of potentially hazardous objects, FOES, P-H-O-S, it's a subset of near-Earth objects whose orbits predict they will come within 5 million miles of Earth's orbit and of a size large enough, 30 to 50 meters or larger, to cause significant damage on Earth. So it looks at them, it evaluates the risks and so on. Um, and basically there was a couple papers by NASA, one here, 2014 report, NASA's efforts to identify near-Earth objects and mitigate hazards. So let's... Uh, continue on and have a look at that. So this is a paper. Um, you know, it's all open source. Have a look at it if you want. NASA's efforts to identify near-Earth objects and mitigate hazards. So it goes through and it talks about, uh, you know, the things that you need to do. So here's the Chelyabinsk uh, meteor, you know, that famous photograph. Um, the you know, rep repetition of this. This is like any, a one at once every 30 or 40 years event. This one happened to come down near a city. NASA, basically near Earth, Earth objects with a diameter greater than a kilometer or 0 0.62 miles pose the greatest threat to Earth because they're, you know, in terms of the greatest hazard or the greatest risk, right? So it's estimated that based on the you know, larger ones will do more damage, but they're much, much, much more or less likely. So they estimate that the risk is highest with this sort of, you know, one kilometer type diameter system. So there's a program to detect all of these things with, you know, very powerful telescopes to calculate their trajectories, to find out if any are threats to Earth, like to categorize the risks of them all. And, and so on, okay? So there's a, a, a detailed document on this sort of thing. And I want to focus on a table in this document. This is the approximate impact frequencies and consequences from near-Earth objects. So if the diameter of the object is less than 30 meters, you know, then the impact energy will be less than 5 megatons. And this will happen every 1 to 50 years. The Tunguska-like event greater than 30 meter diameter object, higher um, impact energy, that's a, once every 250 to 500 years. And then a 140 meter event would be a regional event, uh, large subglobal, low global, medium global, high global, and here we have extinction class event. So greater than 10 kilometer diameter object, greater than 100 million megatons of energy released, and this would happen only once every 100 million years. So fortunately, very low. Um, and this is a type of, uh, you know, dino um, size uh, event. Okay, so as you obviously, as you get to larger and larger diameter objects, the probability thankfully goes way, way down. It scales sort of inversely. The larger the object, the smaller the probability of it impacting. But of course, the consequences, you know, go up. Uh, you know, exponentially. Okay, so we do have a national near-Earth object preparedness strategy and action plan. Um, this is the presidential of the president of the the executive office of the president of the United States SEAL, 
National Science and Technology Council. This is a report that was done in June 2018 to assess the, uh, you know, the risks. And they have, of course, they use crazy acronyms here. Da the Damien IWG. Oh, of course, the Damien IWG. Damien detecting and mitigating the impact of earthbound near-earth objects. The Damien and the IWG Interagency Working Group. They do this so nobody can understand what group is behind this. Are they serious, right? It's just to confuse people with these crazy acronyms. Okay, so all of these people, all of these other acronyms. So basically they look at, uh, you know, these ideas of, you know, what do you need to do? Okay, so this is a, this is basically a, a survey. First thing is, you know, what's out there? How many and which direction are they going? What size are they and what risk are they? So this is, uh, the red here is the estimated number of near earth asteroids. Okay, so the very small ones, this is, this is in kilometers diameter. So this is 10 meters to about 25 meters in diameter. Chelyabinsk was sitting right here. So there's lots of these guys, you know, 100 million almost, not quite, going down to about a million in this size. So as you go up, the, the number is less, but there's still, there's gazillions of them. Then we go to city size, uh, city affecting events here from about 25 meter in diameter up to about um, 75, say, meters, meters in diameter. 0.075 kilometers. We have the Tunguska event here. You know, there's a lot fewer of these guys. Um, and then we go to region, regional affecting events. So 80 meters in diameter to 320 meters or so. Then we have continent size events. Then we have the KT impact. So 10 kilometer impactor. Okay, so as you go to higher, larger and larger size, you get fewer and fewer of them. This is the percentage of near-Earth asteroids that we've discovered. So we haven't discovered very many of the smaller ones. They're very difficult to see. This thing came in as a complete surprise. When we go to the Tunguska size, we're having more effect that we're detecting, you know, maybe 10% of these guys. You know, as we go to larger and larger ones, we get to higher and higher percentage of, percentages of, of detection. I'm not sure why this is dropping here. Um, and then we go to these really large ones and we can, uh, we can detect almost 100% of them. These are asteroids. The problem is, is there could be comets out there that are very large that are heading directly to Earth and we wouldn't know, uh, we wouldn't have more than a few years notice if we were lucky on these, these guys. Okay, so uh, they, this, is a, this is the Tunguska sized event superimposed over New York City, just to give you a scale of size and to scare you. These are the near-Earth asteroids discovered. Most recent discovery, April 8, 2018, as of when this was published. So we're detecting more and more of them. These are all the ones over 140 meters. These are the really big ones over a kilometer. And, you know, this is what we do. We basically, we need to detect, categorize, and track these things. Then we need to, if they're heading for Earth, we need to deflect them or disrupt them. Or, you know, in the worst case, just move everybody to the other side of the Earth if one is coming, right? Um, impact, response, and recovery. So, okay, so this is a very uh, useful report to read. Um, you know, it's very recent. People are taking this uh, threat more seriously than they were a few years ago. Ways, how do we stop an asteroid from hitting the Earth? This is the most fascinating thing. Ten ways to stop a killer asteroid, right? So basically, what do we do? Well, we need to find these things. We need to track them. If one's heading, we need to characterize it. You know, is it stony um, rock? Is it ice? Is it uh, iron nickel? We need to deflect them if it's coming to Earth. So we can use a gravity tractor. We put a spacecraft near it and the gravity pull of the, of the spacecraft pulls the asteroid towards it over a long period of time, deflects it. We have a kinetic impactor hitting the asteroid to deflect it or break it apart. We use lasers to ablate the surface. The surface heats up, ejects gases, moves it off its track, or a, the nuclear option, detonate it, you know, hope we can break it into small pieces that will burn up in the atmosphere. 
So those are all the possibilities. Anyway, thank you for listening.